Jim Hogan, and I'm happy to welcome you here on behalf of the Consortium on Energy Policy Research and the Harvard Project on International Climate Agreements here at Harvard for this lunch discussion with the European Commissioner for Climate Action, Arnie Pettigrew. In uh, 1965, uh, LBJ was the first American president to receive a report from his scientific advisors warning him of the dangerous concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and the problems of climate change. A prediction of climate warming was made at the time when the climate was actually cool. Uh, Forty-five years later, the scientific advisor of the president suggested that we should switch calling it climate change and switch to calling it uh, global climate disruption. Uh, in that encapsulation of what's happened with the scientific advisors and trying to characterize this problem is the problem that we have, which is that so little has happened uh, over such a long period of time when we have known about this problem. A lot more than nothing has happened, but if you are uh, concerned about this, uh, you can read in many places uh, the studies that show how much more has to be done. Uh, an important part of that process is the UNFCC process, the meetings at uh, Copenhagen, and Connie Hederard has been a prominent actor in that, particularly in Denmark, where as the Minister of Climate and Energy, she was involved in uh, the preparation for and the actions at uh, Copenhagen. Uh, since that time, there's been a great deal of discussion on, uh, as to whether or not that uh, was uh, a, a great success or a great failure. I, for one, uh, expected little, and I was quite pleased at what happened in Copenhagen as being real progress that I didn't expect to see happen, particularly in drawing in developing countries. But I'm sure that uh, Commissioner Hedegaard is going to be able to address that further about uh, where we go from here in order to address this grand challenge, the mother of all externalities, the great problem of our generation and the generations to come in dealing with uh, the threats of global climate disruption. Thank you very much, Professor Hogan, Professor Stavin. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's indeed a great honor to be given the chance to address faculty members and students at this world-class seat of learning. So thank you very much for the invitation to speak here today. I will definitely take care that I'm not doing all the talking because one of the reasons why I'm here is also to have an exchange of views with you, hopefully also uh, in order to try to understand even better what's going on in, in the US. And I hope that what I'm saying will be emphasizing why that is actually key to all of us, what is going on here in this country. So I would like to take the next half hour or so to set out the European Union's view of international climate policy, and then I hope we can have a lively discussion as well. I know, of course, that this is an issue that is closely followed here at Harvard, and in particular by the Bilfer Center. The research and analysis you produce is a valuable contribution to the international debate on climate change policy and the search for a global deal, and I can assure you that it is being read also in the European Commission. So sometimes you're saying, is anybody reading this? And I can say, at least in the European Commission, we are definitely following whatever you're doing. I think we all noticed that the past few months have brought tragic and shocking reminders of the massive human, economic, and environmental costs the world faces from climate change. I do not have to go into a lot of details there, just referring to the heat waves in Russia, what we saw of floodings in Pakistan, mudslides in Mexico and in China, heat records made in the Middle East up to 56 degrees Celsius, I even do not know how much it is in, in Fahrenheit. There are so many examples from this recent summer. I know, of course, that you cannot because you just see heavy rain outside your window. You cannot sort of call that climate change. Of course not. Weather and climate is not the same. And I'm not a climatologist. So I'm not to say when I hear the, about this event or that event, oh, that's due to climate change. That would not be serious. 
But what I can tell as a politician is that what we have seen in these different areas is falling shockingly well in line with what science has warned us would be exactly the form in which climate change would come to the respective regions. Severe precipitation there, heat waves there, drought there, and so on and so forth. So I just wonder how many more warnings mankind needs uh, before we start acting and not just talking whether we have a problem and, and, and not. And just here in the beginning to sort of say where I come from, I'm a conservative politician originally from, from Denmark, now the European Union's Commission for Climate Action. But in my political philosophy, I'm a conservative, a European conservative. And I believe that, say in 20 or 30 years from now, when all the ice core drillers have analyzed their findings, Say they came back and told us, oh, we were wrong there at the beginning of the 21st century. What happened with the climate, that was not due to the sort of man-induced fact, it was not something about CO2 and so on and so forth. What would that have been the worst thing if we, due to these warnings, had invested in more clean technologies, more energy efficient technologies, getting cleaner, cars, less air pollution, and so on and so forth. Would that not in any case be a good idea when we're becoming 9 billion people on planet Earth when my children will be my age? Whereas if the climatologists are right in their warnings, then we would take on quite a huge responsibility in neglecting these warnings and not doing what we have to do by now. That is sort of my basic approach to this. And I think that what we saw this summer it serves as a stark reminder that every country needs to anticipate and adapt to the impact of climate change and also of the huge challenges we all face in doing so. Uh, the Kennedy School's discussion paper responding to threats of climate change, mega catastrophes, is an important contribution to thinking and awareness raising on the issue of disaster preparedness. And I think this summer taught us why this is very, very so the recent events ought to be the wake-up call to all of us. It ought to be the wake-up call to the international community that strong and effective action to limit global warming is needed and it's more urgent than ever. I believe that this call must be heeded and translated into real progress towards a global climate deal in the coming weeks and months. One might well wonder whether it's a coincidence that these extreme weather events have occurred in a year that seems to be on track to set a new global temperature record and which follows a decade that was itself the warmest on record ever. This year actually globally we had the warmest March ever, globally we had the warmest April ever, globally we had the warmest May ever. According to the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration here in the United States, the global average temperature over the first six months of 2010 was the highest in the 130 years of record keeping. And this is despite the cold winter we had in the Northern Hemisphere, <coughs> which did so much to increase public skepticism. I think you experienced it here. I can guarantee for sure that we did very much in Europe. Right now, the Earth is on an average already around 0 0.8 degrees Celsius, that is 1.4 degrees Fahrenheit, warmer than in pre-industrial times. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, has projected that continuing with business as usual will most likely lead to further warming of between 1.8 and 4 degrees Celsius on average this year century. In the worst case scenario, the global temperature could increase by up to 6.4 <coughs> degrees Celsius or 11.5 degrees Fahrenheit. Since these figures are all averages, the temperature rise would be even higher in some regions. The IPCC has definitely had its share of adverse publicity over the past few months, but the main findings of its report from 2007 are unchallenged. 
And I think it's very important to emphasize that also now when they have been analyzed, critically analyzed, then what came out as a result is that yes, the IPCC made some minor errors, but overall it has done a very difficult and very important job, and they did it well. A temperature increase, even at the lower end of the range projected by the IPCC, <coughs> could cause irreversible and potentially catastrophic changes in the global environment. The lives and livelihoods of millions of people around the world would be put at risk. This, of course, is one of the reasons why, back in December 2007, the world community as such, at the International Climate Conference in Bali, put a deadline to the international climate negotiations. The deadline, as you knew, know, was Copenhagen, December 2009. The real threat of dangerous climate change is undoubtedly also one of the reasons why the UN Secretary General has set up now the high-level panel on global sustainability, which actually met for the first time yesterday in New York, where we had to try to discuss exactly how can we have the growth that we need in the world when at the same time we have to pursue a low-carbon future. And I must say I'm very proud to be on that panel and I think it's in, in extremely important what kind of recommendations we could, could come up with before the end of next year. It should be obvious that a global threat to which all countries contribute to a greater or lesser degree can be addressed most effectively through a globally agreed framework. Reaching a global agreement requires strong political leadership and courage to resist vested interests that want to preserve the high carbon status quo. Shifting from our present model to a low carbon future is a vast challenge. But as I see it, and as I think most people in Europe see it, it's also a huge opportunity to reinvigorate our economies and accelerate our exit from the crisis. Innovation in low carbon technologies such as energy efficiency, renewable energy and carbon capture and storage promises to generate new sources of economic growth and jobs and to strengthen our economy's energy security. Clean technologies tend to be more labor intensive than dirty ones. Uh, if you'll permit me to quote some West Coast research for a moment, Professor Dan Cannon at Berkeley has found that every dollar invested in renewable sources of energy generates three to five times more jobs than a dollar invested in fossil fuel energy sources. And it is a market that is growing rapidly. A recent analysis by the HSBC Banking Group forecasts that the global market for low carbon energy and energy efficiency technologies will at least double over the next 10 years and actually it's more likely that it will triple. <coughs> I don't know for how many other sectors you can sort of predict growth rates like this. If, it's, if we're talking about a tripling, it will grow to $2.2 trillion. Who is going to get the biggest slice of that pie? <coughs> a global competition is already well underway. And it is clear to me that China's huge ambitions make it a formidable competitor for both Europe and the United States. China is undertaking now the biggest green stimulus program of all, worth some 230 billion US dollars. Together with Taiwan, it already produces most of the world's photovoltaic panels. Chinese wind turbine manufacturers now appear in the global top 10. They have three wind manufacturers in the global top 10. 10 years ago, they had no wind manufacturers. They themselves believe that within three to five years, they will have two or three in the global top five. And last year, China installed more wind power capacity than any other country. It is pouring money into developing electrical cars, when I sometimes discuss this with European CEOs, they can also now report that sometimes they are met with tougher environmental standards in China than they will be in some parts of Europe. 
Uh, we saw recently that China is now setting CO2 reduction targets in some cities and in, in uh, regions. Uh, and I, just to make this short, because this is not a long speech about China, but I think that many will be in for a surprise when we see the next draft of their next five-year plan, because I actually do think they are in embracing this agenda very, very much. In the European Union, we intend to stay at the forefront of the low carbon revolution. And we know this will require continuous efforts for us to drive innovation. We intend to do so through proactive climate and energy policies. We have committed unilaterally, as you will know, to a reduction of 20% by 2020, uh, compared to 1990 levels. You, we will do that no matter what the rest of the world does, and we have already passed the legislation and made the effort sharing between our 27 member states. We are also committed to having 20% uh, uh, of our energy stemming from renewables also by 2020. And in addition, we are offering to increase our emissions reduction to 7% over the same time scale, 20 compared to 1990, provided other major economies also commit to take on a fair share of the global effort. We believe that this reflects the IPCC's analysis that collective emissions from developed countries need to be cut in the size of 25 to 40% below 1990 levels by 2020, if we are to have a fair chance to stay below the two degree ceiling that leaders from 140 countries have submitted to under the Copenhagen Accord. Obviously, the European Union cannot do this alone. Actually, we are accounting for 14% of global emissions, and our share is falling due to the different efforts that we are doing, but of course, not the least because others are increasing still more. Europe wants a global deal that is ambitious, comprehensive in terms of scope and international participation, and legally binding. That is what the climate needs, we believe. There were widespread hopes and expectations that the Copenhagen Conference last December would take us to a global deal. In the end, it was not possible. The political will, in the end, was not there in Copenhagen. Nevertheless, the Copenhagen Accord that resulted represents progress, as also the professor started stating. Firstly, industrialized and developing countries alike accepted for the first time that they share responsibility in addressing climate change. That might not sound like a revolution, but when you have followed the international climate negotiations for years, I would say that if I two or three years back had told you that India and China and others would accept that we cannot do this without their, them taking a co-responsibility, then actually it was a major step forward. They also accepted what, that we must aim to stay below the two degrees, that is the 3.6 Fahrenheit limit. And almost 140 countries together, responsible for more than 80% of global emissions, have associated themselves now with the Copenhagen Accord, and more than 75 countries have notified targets or actions to limit or reduce their emissions. Actually, one of the most interesting things happening in the run-up to Copenhagen, and which I believe is a signal, a sign that to create international pressure actually works, that was that in the last months up to Copenhagen, Russia strengthened its target, so did Japan. Indonesia, for the first time, came forward with a target. So did Brazil, so did India, so did, in the end, even China. So did Korea, so did Mexico. In other words, many of the G20 in the run-up to Copenhagen set domestic targets. That's not the same as making them internationally and legally binding and things like that. But of course now they're trying to live up to these targets that they have promised their domestic electorate. As the Belfast Center and others have pointed out, even the high-end pledges, though, fall well short of what is needed to stay below the two degrees Celsius. But it was a start, it is a start, and then they will need to be ratcheted up over time. Secondly, the industrialized world has put a considerable amount of money on the table to help developing countries combat climate change. Nearly 30 billion US dollars 
was promised in fast back money for this year, next year, 2012. And the target was set that by 2020, each year, we should try to provide 100 billion US dollars for climate related purposes. I want to make it very, very clear. There is no way it's going to happen through only public channels. Of course, this will have to be a combination of public and private financing. I believe it's absolutely crucial that now the developed countries deliver on the fast start finance promises given in Copenhagen. <coughs> For too many times, they have witnessed <coughs> fine pledges being given at fine international conferences, but they never saw the money. It's the whole credibility of the developed countries that are now at stake when we come to Cancun in this end of November and December. They must see that we are serious, that we have delivered, and I'm glad to say that in the European Union, we have already black and white shown that we are on track to live up to our pledge, which is to finance more or less one third of this in all 30 billion US dollars. Certainly, in several areas, and notably on the issue of transparency, the Copenhagen Accord also provides important political guidance for the continuing negotiations on a global agreement. Also, Copenhagen put climate change at the top of the political agenda, even in a year of political crisis. Who would have thought that? I mean, even here in the US, if it did not make it to the very top, then at least among top three or top four. That created unprecedented momentum for action in the months beforehand. We had 120 heads of states coming to Copenhagen, and I think that their presence sent a powerful message that world leaders recognize the serious and urgent threat from climate change. I want to take this opportunity to pay tribute to President Obama's very important contribution, actually his dynamism and personal commitment were key factors in the conclusion of the Copenhagen Accord. Now the Copenhagen Accord provides a basis for moving forward, and the international community must now build on that. <coughs> there is a tendency that people start to reopen it and want to backtrack. We cannot afford that. We still have a very long way to go to reach the strong, comprehensive, and legally binding global agreement that we need. Uh, but I think that uh, it is very, very important that Cancun now does not start backtracking because then I see very, very big uh, challenges ahead for the whole UN FCC process. When you make sort of a pressure mobilization like we did in the run up to Copenhagen, and you do not sort of manage to get the whole agreement that we should have had. Then I think that after Copenhagen, it's very, very important to be careful about how are we then proceeding. As a new Climate Action Commissioner in the early March, I suggested that the world should sort of try to pursue a stepwise approach. That is what the European Commission has suggested. And that means that now we must try to be very, very practical. Try to get progress on substance in Cancun. Then maybe afterwards it's easier also to agree on the future legal form. The European Union would be ready also to make, to make the, the legal agreement in Cancun. But I don't know if you heard anything new coming out of Washington coming out of Beijing, coming out of other capitals since Copenhagen. And therefore, I think we must try to be very, very practical. <coughs> um, I would not sort of hide that it is a tremendous challenge for all of us dealing with international climate negotiations, that still there is no legislation done here in the US. Additionally, a number of major emerging economies remain reluctant to bring their domestic actions on climate change into an international framework. And I think that the matter of the fact is that as long as you don't have legislation here in the US, then it's much too easy for others to hide behind the back of the US. Um, I know that here in the US, sometimes people will be reluctant because they fear what would happen 
if you are ambitious and China is not. I believe we must be careful not to miss opportunities because of fear. If we fear our competitors, we should improve our competitiveness. Because I really do believe that carbon leakage is not a one-way street. Yes, you can lose jobs if you are too ambitious and others are not. But you can definitely also lose a lot of jobs if you are too hesitant while other others are moving, although they are not moving around the negotiation table. <coughs> the proactive stance of the Obama administration and the House approval of the Waxman market bill last year are of course very welcome. But in Europe, we had surely hoped that Waxman Markey, or something like it, with a federal cap and trade system at its heart, had been followed up in the Senate. It's also a disappointment, as I said, I'm a conservative from Europe, and I have been brought up to know that no matter what kind of challenge we are faced with in the world, we can count on the US. World War I, World War II, the fight against terror, the Cold War, whatever, when we face global challenges, we could always count on the United States. I think that it is uh, a sad thing for those of us who like the US, who see the US as our allies, that this is not the case in, in this field. I also wonder why. Because it's not for lack of information. America leads the world in so many fields of research related to climate change such as, for instance, atmospheric science and satellite monitoring. Nor can it be because climate change is not primarily a military issue. After all, the Pentagon has identified it as one of the greatest risks to homeland security. Is it perhaps because, as President George Bush Sr. famously said, the American way of life is not negotiable? Well, if all of us continue business as usual, your lifestyle will definitely be threatened. But also the American way of life is more than the high carbon lifestyle associated with SUVs and giant stakes. For me, it's about a free society that allows people to make the best use of their abilities. A vibrant, open economy that gives entrepreneurs the freedom to innovate and create new products and jobs. And that makes this country particularly well placed <coughs> to reap the benefits of the low carbon revolution. A favorable policy framework would help stimulate the entrepreneurship this country is so famous for. And I ask myself, why is it that the most energy efficient cars are not produced in the US? Why does Asia have to take all the technology awards? And I also ask myself, why the addiction to oil remains. To me, energy security is an extremely solid argument for rigorously pursuing a low carbon track. Why continue to borrow loads of money from the Chinese to buy oil from the Middle East? It does not make much economic sense. For now, it looks like the legislative statement in the Senate is starting to hurt investment in the US economy. Earlier this month, Ernst & Young reported that China has now overtaken the US to top its index of the most attractive countries for investment in renewable energy projects. And the manager of a major international asset fund was recently quoted as criticizing the US for being asleep at the wheel on climate change, job growth, and the industrial revolution taking place in the energy industry. What was his conclusion? Well, this bank would invest the considerable funds it manages in other places, principally in China and in the European Union. What this shows is that too little policy action can be as damaging to investment and employment as an overambitious climate policy that runs the risks of driving production and jobs abroad. In Copenhagen, President Obama pledged that the U.S. will reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by 17% of 2005 levels by 2020, the target set in the Waxman Market Bill. It is encouraging that the administration is sticking by this goal despite the absence of Senate legislation. So we look forward to seeing progress. Inevitably, we all have to contribute by lowering our emissions. And I wish we could turn it into an innovation race we all participated in to win. 
We will look carefully at the US action in the coming years, both legislative as well as innovative actions, and to the impact they have on emissions. Because there is only one way forward, and that is to get emissions down. And allow me just one final remark on this. <coughs> I think in this interdependent global world of the 21st century, it's very hard to see how you can have a leadership position in the world if you do not accept multilateral solutions. And if you're not yourself part of multilateral solutions, how on earth can we then expect others to wanting to be there? I think there is a huge responsibility there with the United States of America to try to help the rest of us how we can build international rules that we all have to follow and abide with in this century. Well, in the meantime, everyone needs to have realistic expectations for Cancun. I know it would certainly not be the end of the road, uh, but what we want to see in Cancun is a balanced package of decisions that both captures the progress achieved so far and lays a solid basis for completing a global deal as soon as possible. What do I mean by balanced? I mean that it's not enough just to make progress there where the developed countries minus the US is in the Kyoto track and then there will be no sort of progress in the other track where all the other countries are. It must be balanced. For us, it is key that the Cancun outcome angers into the UN process, the progress and the pledges put forward so far under the Copenhagen Accord and provides a framework for strengthening these through international cooperation. I already mentioned the finance, it must be delivered in Cancun, but also Cancun must solve a number of more architectural issues. For instance, we must have an agreement on how to measure and report and verify whatever we can agree upon. That is absolutely key, that it's transparent, that what you pledge can also sort of be controlled by others. This greater transparency um, is needed to bring, build trust between North and South. And the issue of MRV, as it is known in the Shokong, was a particular bone of contention between the US and the China in the negotiations in Copenhagen. The final text of the accord provides useful guidance, but this needs to be further elaborated. A process should be launched in Cancun to develop guidelines next year. And I think here we have a huge challenge for China to be honest with you, be frank with you, because China does not like a lot of transparency here, but that is required for them also to play their role in the international world of the 21st century. Then, just very briefly, a balanced package of decisions should also include a set of decisions on forestry and adaptation to areas where we actually had substantial progress in Copenhagen. We also ought to be able to conclude a decision on a technology framework uh, so these could be part of a, a combined a package. We also want to see an agreement to set up new carbon me market mechanisms, sectoral cooperation, for instance, and then we want to have included targets for reducing emissions from international aviation and maritime transport. All in all, this is a rather substantial package for Cancun. <coughs> We also envisioned that some of these decisions would be underpinned by the early launch of specific projects in developing countries to be financed by the Five Star funding. On a less upbeat note, the, US is, the EU is very concerned at the growing imbalance between the two tracks, as I mentioned. Uh, there, I need to say that we will not accept an unbalanced agreement, and one more thing. We can, of course, not accept that the only thing we can agree in Cancun would be on finance, and then all other things would be left for later. That's not the kind of deals that can be made this year, definitely not. So everybody will have to contribute their fair share to a global agreement, uh, and that is also what we say when we say it, it has to be balanced. Even a developing country also not an emerging con country, but a developing country, they will have to do the best to their ability. That is what 
is in the notion of common but differentiated, and that will have to be reflected in whatever comes out of the conclusion. The fact is that the United States and the major emerging economies must play their full part if the world is to have a chance of preventing dangerous climate change. By 2020, it's said that China will emit 30% of all emissions <coughs> in the world. Needless to say, we cannot address this without China. And unless and until they do so, EU cannot and will not sign up to a second commitment period under Kyoto. <coughs> I want to be very clear about this. All this is not to say that Cancun cannot still deliver the solid and balanced package of decisions we need, but basically we only have six days of negotiations before we meet in Cancun, so time is very, very short. The last preparatory session in Chinchin in China early next month needs about all to achieve consensus on what the Cancun outcome should be and then make rapid progress towards preparing the individual decisions that will make up the package. Ladies and gentlemen, before I conclude, allow me finally to take this opportunity also to update you on the climate action we are taking in Europe very briefly. First of all, we are well on course to meet or even comfortably overachieve the collective 8% reduction that we took on in Kyoto. Uh, we just had a new report out compared to 1990 we have reduced emissions in Europe with 17%. Even if you from that deduct the crisis years, then still the trend is very, very clear. And in the same period, our economy grew by 40%. Of course, the recession has made a substantial contribution to reducing emissions, but the target was already well within reach before that. What have we done? Well, a lot of things. But for instance, we have had restrictions on fluorinated industrial gases, energy performance standards for buildings, and CO2 emissions limits for, for new cars, just to mention a few. And my whole portfolio as Climate Action Commissioner is about trying to mainstream climate thinking and energy efficient solutions into all relevant policy areas, transport, agriculture, energy, and so on and so forth, research, innovation. But much the most important of these initiatives is the EU emissions trading system, which has put a price on carbon that applies to some 40% of our emissions today. For the medium term, we have set ourselves ambitious climate and energy targets for 2020 and adopted a major package of leg legislation to implement them. As I said, we also have our renewables targets and uh, through a major program to improve Europe's energy efficiency, we aim to reduce our energy use by 20% of projected levels over the same period. That will, at the same time, also improve our energy security, making us less dependent on imported <coughs> gas from Russia and oil from the Middle East. So there are many reasons why we do this. But I make no secret <coughs> that we have done it also to get a head start on the road towards the low carbon economy. We want the increased growth, the extra jobs, and the greater energy security that the development of low carbon technologies and infrastructure promises. We estimate that the massive expansion of renewable energy will put some 130 billion euros worth of extra investment into this sector and create some extra 700,000 new jobs by 2020. The package will strengthen our energy security by reducing our vulnerability to external energy shocks. And looking ahead to 2050, the EU is committed to reducing our emissions much further to between 80 to 95 percent below 1990 levels as part of the industrialized world's contribution to at least halving global emissions by mid-century. In that sense, our target for 2050 is similar to what is in the Wexman market bill. Early next year, the Commission will be proposing a detailed roadmap of how to then to reach the 2050 target, including a 2030 target so that our investors already by now 
will know what can they sort of see coming for 2030. Our emissions trading system, the EU ETS is central to Europe's climate strategy. It is, in fact, our key instrument for achieving deep emission cuts at the least cost. As part of the climate and energy legislation, this system is undergoing a major overhaul that will make it stronger and more effective from the start of our third trading period in 2013. And the reformed ETS will deliver about two thirds of the emission cuts needed to reach our 2020 target. With the ETS, we have actually borrowed an American intervention and then we ran away with it. There is no doubt in our mind that the starting point for a cost efficient climate policy has to be putting a price on carbon. And we do continue to hope that in this country, carbon trade will progress from the current regional initiatives into a federal system. And when that time comes, then we want to work together. Provided there are no problems of comparability, we would want to link the EU ETS with the US system to create a transatlantic <coughs> carbon market. Our ambition is to build a much larger and stronger international market than exists today. First by linking up the carbon trade systems of developed countries and then by bringing it to the emerging economies in the medium term so that we will get the global market, the global price of carbon. We see the creation of new sectoral carbon market mechanisms for the major emerging economies as an important stepping stone towards their eventual introduction of broad carbon trade systems. And that is why we want a decision to establish these mechanisms as part of a Cancun package. Actually, we're already working with China on sectoral approaches, and we think that we can actually both benefit from this cooperation. Before I end, I want to comment on a thing that I know you will hear a lot about in, in the weeks to come. Before, because uh, besides reforming the ETS, we are also in Europe expanding it. Above all, by bringing the civil aviation sector into the system at the start of 2012. International aviation is not today covered by the Kyoto Protocol, and it is not currently subject to any emission reduction targets except Europe's unilateral commitment to cut our overall emissions by 20% by 2020. This has to change. Emissions from aviation are growing faster than from any other sector, and all forecasts indicate they will continue to do so under business as usual conditions. By 2020, even with significant efficiency improvements of 2% a year, international aviation emissions are projected to be around 75% above <coughs> their 25 levels, and by 2050, a staggering 300 to 600 percent higher. <clears throat> Forecasts like these, it would be completely irresponsible, we believe, to do nothing. Firm action is needed. But so far, no action is being taken at international level. And so far, we have taken the initiatives ourselves to bring flights to and from the European Union into the EU ETS. We believe cabin trade is the most economically efficient way of addressing this issue, <coughs> and we believe we are legally entitled to do so under the terms of the Chicago Convention that regulates international <coughs> civil aviation. Our legislation means that flights responsible for around 35% of global aviation emissions <coughs> would be subject to an emissions cap from 2012. It is a good start, but what we really want to see is global action. So, we are proposing that the international climate negotiations should set a global target of reducing emissions from international aviation to 10% below 2005 levels by 2020. And we also propose that ICAO, the International Civil Aviation Organization, be tasked with establishing measures to achieve this target over the next year. We want to see these decisions taken in Cancun and now when the ICAO is going to have their annual meeting opening here in 10 days, I think, I just want to say to the colleagues here in the US, one thing is that you cannot make your own legislation, but we do not think that you should make it an obstacle for others if we actually want to do something to cope with climate change. Um, 
I would end on that note. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, the urgent need for a global climate agreement, I believe it's clear for what to see. The Cancun conference can and must take us a good step forward. And my fear is that the prospects of reaching our destination will remain slim as long as the US delays passing climate legislation. Europe is not alone in hoping that this great country will live up to its responsibilities sooner rather than later. And the global race of green jobs and green growth, I believe this is also squarely in America's own economic interest. For one day last December, the United States, Europe and countries around the world worked intensively together to produce the Copenhagen Accord. Now, the international community needs not only to build on the content of that document, but also to recreate the spirit of global cooperation in which it was created. In facing up to a challenge that threatens to redraw the face of this planet, much more unites us than divides us. Thank you. Um, normally, as an academic, I would like to start out by um, disagreeing and being provocative, and unfortunately, all that I can do is basically agree, amplify, and perhaps provide a little bit of context. Um, let me start by thanking uh, Commissioner for kind comments about the work that we are doing uh, at the Harvard Kennedy School on climate change policy. As I look around the room, I recognize a, a lot of faculty members I know well as well as students who uh, are doing uh, very creative work in other parts of Harvard, Harvard Business School, the Faculty of Arts and Sciences, MIT, Tufts, and it, it is a marvelous group that we have in the Boston area who are working on these problems. I want to start by putting in, in context, if I can, the importance of international cooperation in this realm. And note that I say international, not necessarily global cooperation. And it's the simple reality of the greenhouse gases, as you know, they uniformly mix in the atmosphere. It's a global commons problem. What that means is that for in any individual jurisdiction, the direct benefits of taking action are inevitably going to be less than the direct costs of taking action. That produces what we economists call the classic uh, free rider problem, even though the overall benefits of taking action globally might well exceed the costs globally. And what that suggests is that unilateral action by individual countries will probably be not be sufficient. Yes, Europe has gone ahead on its own, but ultimately what is going to be required is international cooperation. Uh, in particular, as the commissioner emphasized, it's going to require uh, China, India, and the other emerging economies to participate. Even if the OECD countries were to reduce their emissions of greenhouse gases to zero, I didn't say cut them in half or by 80 percent, but cut them to zero, it would be impossible, just physically be impossible to achieve the target that scientists talk about. And then now the governments of the world have uh, officially sanctioned the two degrees centigrade or 450 parts per million stabilization target without China and India, let alone other developing uh, and emerging economies participating. That's the uh, one aspect of the problem. Ironically, we usually think about the fact that countries tend to commit to something internationally, but then just don't do it. Uh, China does it but doesn't want to commit to what it's actually doing. Uh, but somehow, things will come together. So let me then say a word about Copenhagen, which is, of course, the conference which took place, uh, the annual conference of the parties in December of 2009. And then a word about going forward to Cancun in Mexico, which will take place in December of 2010, of what was accomplished uh, last time and what we can or should look forward to this time. The first thing, from my point of view, is to place, to give some perspective to these international negotiations. You know, there's a cliche that we use about the American uh, baseball season, um, when a team is doing very poorly in the first few weeks, and that is that it's a marathon, not a sprint, because there are 162 games. Well, that's even more true about climate change policy and climate change. It is a marathon, not a sprint. The first reason is scientifically, it's a stock, not a flow environmental problem. It's the accumulated greenhouse gases in the atmosphere which cause damages, not the emissions in every year. 
Secondly, economically, all the analysis I know of except one, so I'm talking about dozens and dozens except one of the analysis, indicates that the cost-effective time path to taking serious action involves a gradual ramp up of severity of targets, obviously in order to render uh, in order to avoid rendering large parts of the capital stock prematurely obsolete when you're dealing with a stock uh, problem. And then third, everyone recognizes that massive amounts of technological change are going to be necessary in order to deal with this problem at all, let alone cost effectively, and therefore long-term price signals, as the commissioner said, carbon prices are going to be essential long-term signals. Private industry doesn't make decisions on the basis of today's prices but on um, the expectation of prices over the life of the investment that's being carried out. And then finally, administratively, it's become increasingly clear that the creation of durable international institutions is going to be essential to address the problem. So what does that suggest in terms of perspective? It, it, it suggests to me that international climate <coughs> negotiations are going to be an ongoing process, much like the way we think about trade talks as opposed to a single task that has a clear endpoint. Oh, we're going to fix the problem in Copenhagen. Oh, we're going to fix it in Cancun or the following year in South Africa. The bottom line is that a sensible goal going into Copenhagen last year uh, for the negotiations was progress on a sound foundation for meaningful long-term action, not some notion of immediate success, even though that is more likely to produce good photo opportunities. Now it turned out that what came out of Copenhagen was actually some good photo opportunities for heads of state and the beginning of what I would call a foundation for long-term significant action. And that's because the Copenhagen Accord, which the commissioner referred to, has in it a number of elements which are important, but one of which for those who have followed and worked on climate change international policy are very familiar with and that is this distinction which we have between the Annex I and the non-Annex I countries. The countries that take action, or at least pledge to take action, uh, and those that do not. And that distinction, even though it was not eliminated in the accord, began to blur. And for the first time, as the Commissioner said, China and India and other emerging economies noted publicly that they shared responsibility for addressing the problem even if they did not share the lion's, they didn't have the lion's share of responsibility for the accumulated historical uh, emissions into the atmosphere. So with that, let me just finish up by saying something about what that might suggest for what we could define as success this year, in 2010, in December, in Cancun. Um, first, what would be a success would be if the UNFCCC were to embrace, to fully embrace, rather than view as competition, the parallel processes that are going on. Processes which are not negotiation in some cases, but are discussion and debate. The major economies forum, which continues tomorrow, a creature of the United States and thereby limited because of that. The G20, which is similar in makeup, but is not limited by that because it is not a creature of a single country, although it has its own uh, difficulties in terms of being a forum. What some people would call the C30, which would be the G20 with some of the major uh, smaller countries thrown in who will actually receive the bulk of the damages and, and are trapped in poverty, sub-Saharan Africa, small island states, and the like. So that would be one. A, a, a second uh, mark of tremendous success would be either explicitly or implicitly to consolidate what are now three parallel tracks in the climate policy and to emerge with two tracks. I mean, some of us would think one track is better, but that's probably not uh, doable. There's the Kyoto Protocol track, or the second commitment period, essentially, which obviously the United States is not participating in. There is the long-term uh, agreement <coughs> and arrangements track within uh, the UNFCCC, and now there's the Copenhagen Accord. And if the, the ideas and the principles behind the Copenhagen Accord could be brought inside rather than kept on the ante room, that would be a uh, tremendous uh, success. Uh, also, developing better methods, as the Commissioner said, uh, developing better methods for comparing targets and actions. We have to do both because of the way the Accord is written. For comparing targets and actions across countries would be important. And certainly moving forward with financing plans 
that are in the Copenhagen Accord, but recognizing when doing so that it will be leveraged private sector capital, which is going to have to do the bulk of the job. I didn't say just leave it up to the private sector. There's a role for government to leverage that. And a gap and trade system, which allows for offsets from developing countries through the CDM, is one superb way, potentially highly effective way, with proper reform, of leveraging massive amounts of private sector capital. Otherwise, governments, at least this government, the US, will never, ever appropriate for those levels of foreign aid. Um, the third area, in addition to embracing these processes and consolidating the tracks, is focusing on some productive steps which can be made on what you could think of as narrow sub-agreements, such as in uh, reduced forest uh, de uh, deforestation and degradation. That's an area where there was considerable success, actually, in progress in Copenhagen. That can be concluded. And then fourth and finally, developing sensible expectations and effective plans. Again, the negotiations on an ongoing uh, process, not a single task with a clear endpoint. We should talk about this the way we talk about international trade and international trade problems, and not expect that the tablets will come down from Mount Sinai or wherever your tablets came from, that they will come down at some moment in time and solve the problem completely. So a sensible goal from Cancun is simply some incremental steps forward for a long-term arrangement for a sensible foundation. So my, uh, and by the way, that, let me just say that that might well include bottom-up approaches such as linkage of the EU ETS with those in other countries. So my prediction for uh, COP16 in Cancun uh, in, in December, remember, is that uh, it may be more enjoyable than Copenhagen was in December uh, last year, but I think it would be inappropriate to think that it's necessarily going to be more productive. And in my case, given what I think about what happened in Copenhagen, that's not damning with faint praise. Thank you. So we are going to now open it up to questions. Uh, I have just two bits of instruction regarding uh, questions. The first is that when you have a question, you proceed to one of the two microphones that are set up. And the other is I want to define what a question is. Um, a question is brief, and it ends in a question mark. So whoever would like to be uh, first, and would you mind going to the microphone so that everyone can hear you, and then we have it for the record. Yeah, oh yes, and please, uh, even though I know who you are, not everyone does, so would you start, you and everyone following by identifying yourself, your institution, et cetera. Yes, I'm Kelly Sims Gallagher. I'm professor of um, energy and environmental policy at the Pletcher School at Tufts, uh, and also a senior associate here at the Belter Center. Um, I was intrigued by this concept that we might experience a backtracking uh, in Cancun. So I was wondering if you would be more specific about what you would characterize as a backtracking. And then probably related to that, could you talk about why it has been so difficult, you know, in sort of back channel, may have greater insight than the rest of us do, to formalize a financing mechanism, a formal institution uh, for financing. Why has that been such a difficult challenge? Do you want to collect some? Okay, um, backtracking, what's that? Well, one of the things is if we're going to discuss fresh from the beginning, whether what's in the Copenhagen Accord should be sort of transposed into the formal negotiations. That's backtracking. If we're going to discuss, is it two degrees or is it something else? Is it this MRV language or is it something else? Is it $100 billion per 2020 or is it something else? I believe that would be very unfortunate because then all the discussions would be up again and then what we actually cashed in in Copenhagen will be sort of wasted and, and I would also fear, honestly, that some would really lose their patience with the international negotiations. So I think that it's rather crucial not to backtrack. Uh, and that's uh, easier said than done. There were formal negotiations in early August in Bonn. And my experts and negotiators who were there, they came back and said in some areas we actually backtrack. The, the, the text needs to shrink, for instance. The number of options, of course, needs to shrink. But instead, for each time they meet, the text is enlarged and there's no more options are coming there. That's not the way you can have a substantial progress in, in results. 
Why, so, why is it so difficult to formulate a financial sort of setup? Well, if I should be very, very brief, I think it's because there is too much mistrust built up over too many years. Uh, for instance, in the relationship between, between the donors and the recipients, the developing countries want to take care that the money that, is, that would be given aimed at, targeted at adaptation and mitigation efforts in their economies, that they have a, a say over this, this money because it has to be integrated so much with their development plans. So there is this fear, if it's only sort of donor driven, where are we then? And, and, and that could be taken care of, but it's just there, there are really a lot of mistrust. And that's why I believe that when we come to Cancun, it's crucial that, that not only Europe, but the United States and Japan and others actually deliver on our fast start pledges from Copenhagen. As a Maldivian ambassador to the UN said to me some months ago, somehow the, the money you are promising us, they are always just around the corner. How nice it would be soon to come around that corner. And I think that should be by the cool. Thank you. You know, I look at the number of individuals in each microphone, the amount of time we have, and the, the long division suggests that questions and well, possibly as well, if your responses can be concise, then we can get through maybe all of you. Thank you. I'm Paul Harris. Um, the comparison was made between uh, um, climate negotiations and trade negotiations as being very long term. And my question is, do you foresee at some point that there might be an organization formed similar to the WTO to deal with climate issues? I think any comparison to the WTO is a nightmare for those of us who are dealing with climate change. So I hope not. Uh, I believe that although it could be tempting to say, why don't we just do it in the G20 or as Professor Stavon said, MEF or whatever, it's just not going to happen in any foreseeable future as far as I can see. Why? Because China and India and others so far have refused to discuss climate to negotiate climate, not to discuss it, but to negotiate climate in any other international sort of form than in the UNFCCC. So I think that we are pretty much stuck with that. Of course, we could create something very new. We would lose a lot of time, years probably, in discussing what that new setup should be. So as long as there is progress in the formal negotiations, I think we should try to cash in as much as we can there and avoid a WTO scenario because Contrary to trade, I mean trade is very important for a lot of reasons, but here in the climate area there is a time factor and it actually does matter whether we agree on something now or not until the next 10 or even more years. And, and the time factor uh, makes me think we should really avoid a WTO scenario. Yes, please. Hi, I'm Mars I'm an AP1 student here. Um, I just wanted to ask if you could clarify your concern about the uh, divergence between the LCA and the KP tracks and, and what you meant by that specifically. Um, and then also, uh, second question, if you, I think if I heard you correctly, you, would, you stated that you would not take a second commitment period uh, in the, in, under the KP track in the absence of significant action from China. And I wanted to ask, uh, to what extent does that include uh, provisions for uh, international consultation and analysis that are included in the Copenhagen Accord? The reason why we think it's incredibly important that we do not just get results in the KP and the Kyoto Protocol track, of course, is that only in the Kyoto, only countries that in all represent 30% of global emissions are asked to do anything. And if we are talking about the next commitment period, that is after 2012, then it is evident that others will have to take some kind of responsibility uh, as well. So that's why, you know, the Mexicans say, oh, Europe would just take a second commitment period. Why don't you just do that? How would that help the environment? I mean, we have our targets. We have set the most uh, ambitious targets in the world. It would change nothing in reality. It would take the pressure away, away from others to be included. Uh, and, and that is why we simply see that, think that if we are going to do this, others will have U.S. will have to say we're doing something internationally, and emerging economies will have to do as well. And there would be other conditions attached to that, by the way. 
uh, there are problems with what we call air use, surplus allowances, hot air, with little CF accounting rules. There are other conditions where we would say if we were to take another commitment period, then we must take care that the environmental integrity in the Kyoto system is man maintained and there we need some reforms and that will have to be part of the agenda in Cancun if we are to consider to take the second period. Yes, sir. Uh, Ian Finlis and I work for the state government in Massachusetts on climate policy. Um, you could argue that in the leadership in China, Europe, and US, the leaders all share belief in climate policy. But within those regions, there's a wide uh, disparity in uh, support for those policies from the broader population. So uh, I'm wondering if in the climate negotiations has been any discussion of education and outreach or other ways of dealing with disparate uh, public support for climate policy? I think yes, it has been discussed uh, time and again. <coughs> Actually, the, the cold winter in Europe started, and then the very day the COP15 started in Copenhagen. And all these delegates, they were just standing there freezing. And we saw, I would actually never thought that things were that vulnerable, but we saw that after one month of cold in Europe, then people start to say, OK, maybe the alarm is called off. <laughs> I mean, to me, it proved that, wow, you really have to get some of this knowledge out even more. Also with the press, I think. There is this tendency in press always to find someone who says there's not a problem and someone who tells you that there is a problem and then they have a five, ten minutes in, in a TV show and then that's it and, and the viewer cannot find out what is up and down. So I think it's still incredibly important to try to sort of give the information, give the facts, avoid to be too uh, alarmist and at the same time also, uh, that was what I tried to say in the beginning, say that okay, you could be a skepticist but wouldn't you think that in any case, it would be a very good idea to become much more resource efficient when 9 billion people in the middle of this century, all of them want to share in the good life. So I think with this energy efficiency agenda, then it's probably easier to reach out to people, uh, also to sometimes argue that you could actually earn money by in an industry or in a household or whatever, in a municipality, in a state, to become more energy efficiency. Actually, it can pay <coughs> off if you do it in an intelligent manner. One thing that will not work is if people get the impression that to be serious about this means that we're going back, back to the Stone Ages, and you cannot have the mobility, and you cannot have this, and you cannot have that, and it's a gray and dull uh, society awaiting. And there I think it's very important that we sort of disseminate the good examples, the intelligent solutions, that this is not about sort of a lot of sacrifice, it's about more intelligent ways of using our resources. I think you can make that a compelling narrative. Sir? Klaus Kiergitz, I'm an MCMBA student. I'd like to ask you, in order to reduce the carbon dioxide emissions, does the EU endorse uh, or even encourage the uh, increasing use of nuclear power? There, the very short answer sir, is that at the European Commission, as I'm representing, we do not uh, sort of uh, interfere with the individual member states' way of having their energy mix. That's up to individual member states. There will be a lot of nuclear in Europe. Some states want it, some not. One thing you should just be aware of, of course, if you are aware of, I guess, and that is that some people tend to believe that nuclear is a very cheap way of achieving a more sort of clean environment. That is not necessarily the case. It's one of the more expensive solutions. But in Europe, some countries would be in for more nuclear, others will oppose it. And uh, our position as European Commission is the energy mix is up to each individual member state. I'm Mizam Khan, a professor back in Bangladesh, uh, now on a temporary visit. I'm also a negotiator with our delegation. Uh, I have two, three very short questions. First question is, what is the European approach to uh, majority voting rule now being discussed because of the reasons I'm not going to explain? This is my first question. Second question is, uh, there are talks now of alternative forums, but unless 
the sense of national sovereignty is moderated with the provision of public goods kind of enlightened self-interest, can those forums be effective? My third question is, uh, can European Union be back on the saddle of uh, leadership in climate negotiations? Because I was in Copenhagen and I saw European Union has been sidelined at the final moment. So can European Union regain uh, leadership? Thank you very much. Three very easy questions. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Han, uh, first about the majority voting rule. I think uh, we need to sort of consider whether in, in, the, in the context of the UNFCCC, this demand of having unanimity has sort of been sort of taken to the extreme. I also understand more extreme than in, in, in other UN uh, contexts. Um, I know that you are not in this uh, capacity here representing Bangladesh, but it would be helpful if some G77 countries would start that discussion also within the, the G77, uh, because we need to be a bit more flexible. I mean, it cannot be that a very, very, very little handful of countries can block whatever the rest of the world is agreeing uh, upon. It, it, it cannot continue. Um, these alternative forums, let me be clear, I'm, I'm very much in favor of that. Europe would show up in whatever context. The problem is that, for instance, right now, while we're here in, in New York, there is a major economist forum. It will be continuing into tomorrow. But as soon as in these informal talks, you just, you know, happens to use the word, maybe we could agree on, then there are numerous protests. Because we should agree nothing, we should negotiate nothing. I mean, we, we must also, when we talk about sort of trust, it must also be that a bit more countries relax a bit and say, of course. One of the problems in Copenhagen was that some people argued that we should put together a global international deal, deal in a plenary consisting of thousands of people. Sorry, you cannot do such a thing. Of course you have to accept that there will have to be minor forums. And as long as it is transparent what is going on there, then you must accept that. Or the process will simply lead us nowhere because it will take forever. Uh, you can produce no results in a university. No, nowhere in the world you can produce results if everyone in a big plenary will, will have a, a, a say in the end. Um, now in Copenhagen, obviously I had other things to do than to follow what EU did and did not did do. That was not my job at the time. Uh, and I think we should take care of one thing, not to create too many myths about what happened. When President Obama looked for Premier Wen Jiabao of China and opened that door and found <laughs> that there you had Prime Minister Singh and Suma and Lula, uh, then of course it was a wake up call for the European Union that nobody sort of felt like maybe we should call the European Union as well. But it's just it was not a deliberate attempt not to include the European Union. And I mean, Coincidence happens, even at that level. Sometimes you go into a room, you think you find one man, but instead you find the leaders of four emerging economies and you start to talk to them. So we should not over-interpret what happens. But one lesson is learned from Copenhagen in a European context. And that is that Europe and its 27 member states must be better at speaking with one voice. Not meaning that only one European is sitting around the table, but what comes out, <coughs> what they say, the message that they convey, that must be in line, that must be the same. And after what we had in Europe, it's called the Lisbon Treaty, it should be easier to provide that, and at least that's what we are very much working to, to achieve. Thank you. Uh, before we take your question, I want to use the Chair's prerogative and to alert two of my colleagues in the audience that I'd like to go to you next for a question. Paula Dobryansky, who's former Under Secretary of State and Global Affairs, has spent years, decades, thinking about this topic. And so I hope we can, if I can ask you for a question. And the other person is Forrest Reinhardt, professor at Harvard Business School, who also has written widely thought about this, but from a different perspective when we're discussing from inside, inside firms and major, major corporations. And so uh, I'm going to take your question, and then I'm going to go to the two of you. When you do, you'll, if you go to a microphone. Thanks. Yes, sir, please. My name is George Mokre, and I've been doing small-scale solar for over 30 years. 
Uh, this is a question for everybody here, and it, the answer is a show of hands. How many people here are committed to do something practical on the International Work Day on climate change on October 10th, sponsored by 350.org? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Paula, you're on. Connie, first, thank you for coming to Harvard. We very much appreciate it. Thank you for your very motivating and stimulating remarks. Let me ask you, how would you and what do you think are the best ways to, at this time, prior to Cancun and post Cancun, engage China and India? What would you recommend? Another easy question. Yeah, very easy. <laughs> And, and, and the very easy answer would be that if the U.S. made its legislation, at least it would be much, much easier. <laughs> One, Poland, and I, as I, I guess you would agree in that, I think we should be careful not to see China and India as the same. I think that they are in rather different positions. Personally, I've really did not understand why they, after Copenhagen, sort of linked themselves so much to basic. I, it's difficult to see what, what's all the basic countries interested in doing so. Because I think actually that up to Copenhagen, the world started to realize that India is not China and China is not India. Their situations are different. Um, I think that India is actu actually engaging very much in the international negotiations. Uh, so is also uh, China, but I think that what is the challenge with China is that somehow it's as if they are doing things first domestically and then they will take the big steps at the international stage. Uh, and, and that is one of the reasons why it sometimes is difficult to interpret exactly what do they want in the international negotiations. Up to last year, I must say, I had not expected that the mobilization up to Copenhagen would have as a result that in a very few weeks before Copenhagen, actually China came forward with a domestic target. You can always argue how ambitious it was, but it was out of sync with their normal scheduling of their five-year plan. And to me, it showed that they actually do care how they're being perceived at the international scene. But the only thing we can do is to try to reach out with them, try to show it's their interest. And then what I just briefly mentioned, for instance, we are working in the European Union now with China on sectoral mechanisms, sectoral cooperation, because I think that in the next five year plan prior to that, they are considering what to do with different sectors, cement, aluminum, steel, other very energy intensive industries. And of course, if there we could work with them, it would be interesting. I had thought when I suggested that, we were suggested it before and they said no, but the census of April, I suggested it to Minister Shea and for the first time they actually said yes. And in July, we had a group of, group of experts in China trying to work with Chinese experts. I think that might be one of the ways that we should work with them. I'm Forrest Reinhardt from Harvard Business School. Thank you very much for coming in for those very inspiring remarks. So from the firm's perspective, it's not just a question of what's good for the earth. It's also a question of distribution of income and opportunity. And you were very eloquent about the opportunities to, that can be created for some firms by aggressive climate policies. But for other firms, they, the leaders think, at least, that they might be losers from such a policy. And maybe since you're from a, a political jurisdiction which has proven better able than we in the United States to persuade, that these, persuade these losers that they're really winners or at least <laughs> roll over them if they were unpersuaded, Maybe you have some advice for us about how the political opposition to the distributional consequences can be indicated. Very briefly, because you know the answer better than I do, but, but um, I think one thing we are not good enough at doing is to disseminate the good business cases. Really to prove where it pays off at the bottom line. And I think that there are many examples. I had a round table with numerous uh, front runners in the business community recently, there are so many good examples there. But it's not known without sort of the, the same service, you know, when you go to World Economic Forum in Davos and you say, oh, there is such a huge interest for climate, but it's the same 100 CEOs meeting and telling the same stories all the time. How can we reach out and tell more about it? I think that uh, 
that, that, that would be, be one of the things that we should be much better at disseminating the good business stories. You have the last question yes. briefly, please. Yes. Uh, Yao Wang from Central University of Finance and Economics, Beijing, China. And I have two short questions. Uh, one is, uh, uh, what's uh, your opinion about CDM's future? Yeah. And the second is, uh, uh, what's the uh, European's, uh, European Union's opinion of uh, the United States climate change policy? And also this question for Uh, I can be very brief there because I think I have hinted a bit uh, what we think about the U.S. climate policies. <coughs> Let me also say I know very well that it's not easy. And um, I also think that's one of the reasons why a lot of Europeans have actually kept relatively silent for a period because we've waited for the U.S. to get its legislation done. I know it's not an easy thing, and if too many interferes, then it might be, be counterproductive. My concern, if I were an American, would be that you are giving away markets that you could get. And as I said, uh, I just don't think in theory, I think that if business are too hesitant here, in, in Europe, elsewhere, then we give away huge market potentials in areas where we actually have sort of lived from it. Could I just add one thing to what, I'll come back to your second question to what Professor Ryan had said about, um, I'm coming from Denmark. In 1980, we had no renewables, basically, zero point some percent. We did not do a lot of in energy efficiency, but after the oil crisis of the 70s, that went so bad that it was prohibited to drive your own private car on Sundays, that was as, as was as it got. Actually, then we started to put up regulation, put taxes on energy use, things like that. And to make a long story short, because of this 30 years of efforts, today 12% of all our export revenues stem from re renewables and energy efficient products. 12% of all our export revenues. And that is created in 30 years. So I think that is one example that it's actually possible to make good business out of this if you do it over a period. And then just to the final thing on CDM, if I could just uh, say that CDM's future, it must be reformed. CDM, in the form that we know of today, should not go to the emerging economies there. We must have it as a more programmatic sectoral thing, not standalone projects. And then the CDM as we know it must be aimed and targeted at the least developed, the poorest, the most vulnerable countries, and therefore, it must be more simple, not as administrative burdensome as it is today. And that should be one of the issues also that we could conclude on in Cancun. We hope, we'll try it, but if not, then we will modernize our own way of handling some of these systems. Uh, let, let me say in, in closing that if you're interested in keeping up on these issues, the one thing I would invite you to do um, is if you have a business card and you're not already plugged into the Harvard Project on International Climate Agreements or you have a slip of paper with an email address on it, give it to Rob Stowe who's raising his hand uh, or to me for that matter afterwards and we'll make sure you're tied in with this ongoing dialogue of this work. I want to uh, thank uh, both Bill Hogan and Louisa Lund from the Harvard Energy Consortium for co-sponsoring this, Rob Stowe and all the other, Jason Chapman, all the other staff from the Harvard Project on International Climate Agreements. Thank all of you for participation, and most of all, of course, thank Commissioner Connie Hedegaard for privileging us with her thoughts today.